Hello! Can you tell I'm running out of daylight? By the quality, light quality of the video. So it's been a while. Durr, got married, busy with the Social Security Administration. Um, I decorated a bit. Got some Halloween decor. My books. This is Halloween decor. Mr. Skull's out year round, but I gave him a festive um, costume um, for fun, I guess. Something to look at besides me, which is not looking so hot today. Probably because I deal with Social Security Office. Makes Secretary of State look like a gift from heaven. But anyway, I have been gone. As you're aware, I got married to Genesis. I know, big surprise. I chose to marry him. La la. It's yellow from our hard water. So I have another true crime for you. Um, personally, I never heard of this case before, but um, after learning about it, this is one of the most stupid criminals I've ever heard of. Like, you know, there's the YouTube videos of like compilation of stupid criminals. It's like that because um, it's a bit more than the stupidly trying to rob a bank. There's a lot more, but oh my gosh, you will just see how not wise he is. And yes, it's the, the killer is a dude. Yeah, again. But today, drumroll. I don't know if you've heard of her, but we are talking about Marion Parker. This took place on December 17th of 1927. Another oldie of her. Oh my gosh, that's almost a hundred years ago now. Oh my gosh. Sorry, it just hit me what year it truly was. I keep thinking 2012 was like two years ago. But Marion Parker was 12. So not great, but this took place in Los Angeles, California, which we've had. I, yeah, we've had cases in California. I mean, it's a big, it's a big state. This stuff happens. And again, the silver lining is this is a solved case. So we know who did it because you know, as I forewarned at the beginning, he he he's not the brightest bulb in the bunch. He might be the dullest in the bunch. But so this is about Frances Marion Parker. She was born alongside her twin sister, who was Marjorie Helen Parker, on October 11th of 1915. Oh, I could have done this like on her birthday, but I just, I'm not fast. I'm just not fast at these. Parents were Geraldine Heise and Perry Marion Parker. Yeah, that's where the, the Marion comes from, is her father. And they had an older brother named Perry Jr. Real original name choosing. But the dad was a very successful banker. And I don't know what the mom did. I don't know if it's specified. Granted, it doesn't really have much to do with the story. But him being a banker has something to do with the story. And they attended the girls. The twin girls attended Mount Vernon Junior High School and on December 15th of 1927 Marion, not her other sister Helen, just Marion of the twins was excused from class by the, it's called the registrar is like the technical term but I just thought it was like the, the school secretary lady, I don't know, the school lady in the office. But the registrar <laughs> Like excused her from class. Her that registrar's name was Mary Holt. And let me tell you, she, I I personally feel like they should have fired her, and you'll see why. Marion was let go. Like was called to the office. Not her sister, just her was let go with a man who claimed to be an employee for their father Perry, who was a successful banker at his bank. She was let to go with this man who worked supposedly with her father because her father was in an automobile accident and I don't know why the registrar didn't think like why not 
the other daughter, but I don't know. The registrar, the secretary lady, when questioned later, she said he did seem confused when she said, which one? For which, when he asked for Perry Parker's daughter and she said, which one? And he just said Marion because that's the one he remembered and because it's the dude's middle name. Um, <laughs> he was confused by that and that didn't set any um, flags to Mary Holt's head. See, fired. So Mary Holt, she also later stated, I would never, quote, I would never have let Marion go, but for the apparent sincerity and disarming manner of the man, end quote. Very. This is why there's so many rules if you want to get your kid and it's, you're not a parent. Because freaking Mary is stupid. Or too trusting. Why not both? So, Marion went with her. Like, she's not going to know her dad's employees. All of her, his employees are like 12. I don't know my dad's em employees now and I'm 22. So she went with him, not the sister. And when she never came home, because, yep, plot twist. Her dad, Perry, was not in a car accident. She was reported missing that day, which is nice that they reported, but she is also, like, under 18. Because I know some people are like, if they're 18 or above, they could have just left because they're an adult. But this is, she's 12, so they're like, um, I was not in an automobile accident. What the heck, Mary? So the next day, on December 16th, the first of many ransom notes came to the Parker home and the man we know it's a man because Mary saw him he demanded fifteen hundred dollars and converted to money nowadays would be about twenty two thousand six hundred and eight dollars so very specific amount and but he wanted it in twenty dollar gold certificates only so it's like asking for a ransom Nowadays, like you want $22,000, but only in $20 bills. I don't know if they do gold certificates anymore, but that's what he wanted. He was, ow. <laughs> he was very specific with his wants. I only want gold $20 bills. So the ransom notes were signed because there was multiple notes. We're not going to dive into all of them here, but they were signed uh, fate, death, and the fox like at different points i don't know if it was ever signed the same twice but the first ransom note actually appeared to have marion's signature on it and it stated quote do positively nothing till you receive special delivery letter end quote i don't know why she would write that but i probably against the against her will but the next note was signed by a George Fox and said, quote, Marion secure. Use good judgment. Interference with my plans, dangerous, end quote. He's very to the point. So they might think, ah, oh, we're onto something because of the Fox is maybe actually this George Fox and he let his name slip instead of just saying the Fox. Oh yeah, his <laughs> the eyeballs are jiggling. Maybe with anticipation for me to stop rambling. Oh, another telegram ransom note stated, quote, no one will ever see the girl again except the angels in heaven, end quote. And this one was signed, fate, not the random George Fox again. So with all these ransom notes going back and forth, because all of this happened very quickly, it was Guy took her, she never came home, she was assigned missing, and then these ransom notes coming. Like, this all happened very fast. They established the meeting location in the late hours of December 16th for the ransom exchange. Because, oh, the dad's actually very smart. Probably, probably he was a very successful banker. But Perry Parker, he recorded all the serial numbers from the bills to track when they are used in the future. Which, very smart idea. Which I technically you could do that now, but there's no like guarantee it'll be like that same bill that you gave to the person 
gold certificates are pretty um, standout-ish and there's no like credit cards back then or anything. So money was a bit easier to trace. So he recorded all the serial numbers. He's like, I'm ready. We're going to don't get him tonight, but we'll get him in the future when he tries to use one of his fancy gold monies. So the first exchange failed when Perry had the police follow him, which any sane person would do. But then, as expected, the kidnapper wouldn't show himself. He's like, no, 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 no. It's police. You think it's stupid? Yes. Yes, I do. But I know the whole story. Oh, and that f flash of pink is from my fun cup full of water. Because why can't you put water in it? There's no rules. So the next day after that failed because the kidnapper's like, mm -mm, you brought the fuzz. On December 17th, more telegrams, more telegram ransom notes came in about the police at the exchange saying, like, today was the last day before Marion would be killed. So, like, they're mad that the police were involved, which they're surprised. So, I don't, I don't know. They're mad about the police, so now they're threatening to kill Marion. Like, it's the last day before her time is out. So, a letter was attached to this in Marion's handwriting, pleading to follow the demands without the police. And as a parent, I can't even imagine what this would feel like. Because, like, you want to catch the guy, but you also want your child safe and sound. It's just, whew. This isn't the movies, this is real life. So after talking with the police, dad, the dad, Perry, was allowed to meet the kidnapper alone out of fear for Marion. Like, he was genuinely afraid because the guy didn't show up when the police were there last time. So he's like, I want my child. So they let him do it by himself. So another telegram arrives later on December 17th stating, quote, P.M. Parker, please recover your senses. I want your money rather than to kill your child. But so far you have given me no other alternative. End quote. What hard choices for this guy. I just want money. The only choice I have is to kill your child. Like, this is how I imagine this guy is. If he's saying something like this, like, all I wanted was money. This is your fault. You just won't give me money. I had to take your kid. <sighs> People. So that night, this is still all on December 17th. The phone calls are made by the kidnapper to Perry. Actual phone calls about the new meeting place the corner of West 5th Street and South Manhattan Place and was told to leave at 7.15 p.m. Very specific. So Perry arrived alone at 8 p.m. and was confronted by the kidnapper only moments later. The man had pulled up next to Perry's car wearing a bandana on his face and held Perry at gunpoint with a sawed-off shotgun. So I know what you're thinking, like, Junebug, he doesn't sound that stupid. We're getting there. We're getting there. Just hold your horse seats to how stupid he truly is. So during the exchange, Perry was able to see Marion, yay, in the passenger seat concealed up to her neck in clothing. Like, like a, imagine a Snuggie, if you will. But it wasn't a Snuggie. And he called out to her like, hey, daughter, with no response. She didn't answer. Her eyes were open, and he thought she was most likely drugged, so she wouldn't escape or fight back or just scream or shout or whatever. So as soon as the money was handed over, the gold, $20 certificates, the man put his car in gear, said, quote, there's your daughter, end quote, pushed Marion out of the car, and sped away. So... Perry got out of his car and he went to Marion and realized, unfortunately, she was already dead. And he called the police. So an autopsy was done on her remains an hour later, which is very fast. 
and she had been dead for about 12 hours, they predicted. Her arms and legs were cut off. That's why she was like wrapped in the snuggy thing to like cover her missing limbs. Unfortunately, she had been disemboweled and her torso was stuffed with a towel and shirt. Um, and unfortunately her eyes, as mentioned, her eyes were open because they were being held open with piano wires to make it look like she was still alive. At least from a distance. I bet if you got close, like when she was out of the car, you'd realize that she's, she's not doing so hot. She's, she's passed. So that is why like, she had like the snuggy, like so much clothes around her because he was trying to cover up the fact that like he cut off her arms and legs. And I do apologize, that was graphic, but um, a warning, much more graphicness is to come. Oh my gosh. It, it startled me a bit when I was doing the research. Just, just a forewarning. So the next day, on December 18th, a man on a walk in Elysium Park discovered her arms and legs wrapped in newspapers scattered on the street. Um, so he, the killer, didn't really hide those very well, or he just didn't care. Granted, when you're kidnapping children for money, I feel like you've thrown caution to the wind at that point, personally. But hey, who am I to judge? So the manhunt for Ma Marion's killer started right away that night, on December 17th. It involved over 20,000 police officers and volunteers and a reward of $50,000 was offered for this man, dead or alive. They didn't care, they just wanted him in and they would give you $50,000 for that. So it was actually raised to $100,000 from donations. Oh, okay. So I did the math for when it was raised to 100,000. So in today's terms, that'd be about $1,507,171. So a lot for um, a reward. Like you see high rewards, but there's never, never usually a million. On December 20th, because remember these 20,000 people are helping to look for her. Killer. Look for her killer. They found her. Um, not alive. On December 20th, the getaway car was found abandoned and found to be stolen in San Diego. Like it was stolen from San Diego. And so obviously it was not the killer's car, okay? He, fingerprints were taken from the door of the car, which I didn't think they had that capability back then, but sweet. So several suspects were considered, but were cleared after Mary Holt, the desk lady that just let Mary and go with this strange man that was surprised that he had twins. <sighs> but at least she remembered the guy's face because she, said all the other suspects they brought to her were not the, the right guy. So the police ended up tracing a laundry mark on the towel that was stuffed in, in, inside Marion to the Bellevue Arms Apartments, which is where they interviewed many tenants. I assume they interviewed all that they could, but it just said many in the articles. So by December 20th, the fingerprints from the car were identified as belonging to William Edward Hickman, who was born on February 1st of 1908. So putting him at 19 years old at this time is this man. And also very fast fingerprint work. So he, this man, it's confirmed to be this man, basically, from the fingerprints, this William Edward Hickman, so Will, he was actually a former co-worker of Perry, Marion's father. And he's not a current co-worker because Perry turned in Will at their bank for forging $400 worth of checks. Which just forging anything is not good, but $400 back then is a lot. So Perry turned him in because he's like, you can't, you can't do that when you work at a bank. It's not polite. It's not polite at any time. So Will got mad at that. I was like, Ugh. 
You can't mind your own business. I'm just, I'm just forging checks for myself. What's this big problem? So Hickman, Will, was put on probation in Missouri for six months for this crime. I don't know why they put him in Missouri, but they did. Also came back from the fingerprints on the ransom notes that the, the fingerprints on the ransom notes were his. They confirmed, which I didn't think there were fingerprints on the ransom notes because they were from like a telegram, but who knows? And they found more of his fingerprints is what I'm saying. And he had just moved to these apartments, they learned, under a different name. He went by Donald Evans. Very creative. What a name. Sorry to any Donald Evans out there that are legit Donald Evans. So in his apartment, they found bloody fingerprints, partly burned drafts for the ransom notes. So like he practiced them, I guess. And newspaper clippings about the kidnapping. Now this is where he starts to get really stupid. Granted, I just think trying to earn money through a ransom is stupid and just not great. It's a horrible thing to do. But this is where it really goes downhill. Because they just find the blood, newspaper clippings, practice ransom notes in his apartment. It kind of points to you, Will. The hunt began again, knowing who they were after. And it led police to Albany, Oregon, where Hickman was, Will, was cited getting gas at a gas station. I know, plot twist. But they were unable to catch him there. But they were able to track him again to Seattle, Washington, with help from another gas station attendant who recognized him in the car. He stole a different car. Also, they were able to track two $20 gold certificates he used from the ransom to purchase clothes on December 21st. It was a good thing that Mr. Perry wrote down all those serial numbers. They came in handy. And it also it's gold money. Who's going to forget gold money? Although maybe it was really popular back then. So at 6.30 a.m. of December 22nd, Will Hickman was getting gas again and was heading towards the Columbian River. Columbian River Gorge, where police were waiting for him. I don't know how they quite got that information. I think another gas station attendee said he might be heading that way or that's what lay ahead in just that vicinity. But they were waiting for him there and they like came around him too. So like when he passed them, like he couldn't turn around and go back. So he at 1.30 p.m. on December 22nd, Will was arrested in Echo, Oregon after a frantic car chase. Which, I don't know what frantic car chases looked like in the 1920s, but I feel like it's not what we imagine today. Once they arrested him, he would deny that he killed Marion. But, would later say, quote, I did it because I wanted the money to pay my way through college. End quote. What? That's not how you go to college, sir. That's not how you do it. In custody, Will would also confess to helping in Marion's kidnapping. He didn't take credit. He's like, okay, you caught me, I helped. And two brothers, he actually, Oliver and Frank Kramer, were the ones who killed her. He just helped with the kidnapping, but they killed her, even though he had already admitted that he needed the money for college. That didn't work, because Oliver and Frank were already incarcerated for several months on different charges. Like, when this happened, they'd already been in prison slash jail for months on end. So I don't know how they did it, Mr. Will, but I think he's lying. That fell through. It stated she wasn't killed in his apartment. He's like, okay, fine, maybe I killed her. But it wasn't at my apartment where the blood is and the stains and the ransom notes. Not there. No. Which is obviously proved false by all the stuff he left there. Idiot. So he was sent back to LA where all this took place. And there he confessed to another unrelated murder and a number of armed robberies. I don't think the armed robberies could be true, but I don't think 
the other murder was ever proven. Either way, he's in big trouble, obviously. You killed somebody. That's not good. So eventually he later just like, was like, okay, you caught me again. I did kill Marion. So this is where it gets a bit intense. So just forewarning there. But he apparently sh strangled her until she was unconscious and then hung her upside down in his bathtub or uh, above the bathtub. I think you get what I'm trying to say. And then mm, slit her throat upside down in the bathtub along her jugular. Mm. And just let her blood drain into the tub. It was very graphic reading about this. <laughs> then obviously we know he removed her arms and legs. For what purpose? I don't know. Just to be an asshole, I guess. But he took her arms and legs off. Um, and then we also know he disemboweled her. Um, again, I don't know why. I don't know why he truly did any of this. I feel like money for college isn't a good excuse, but this is just the way Will thinks. Um, he would later state that the body jerked so forcefully during the disembowelment, she flew out of the tub, he said. His words, flew out of the tub. Which, according to some medical people, coroners, whatever, I didn't, I don't remember what specific, specific medical people, of those coroners, doctors, nurses, whatever, that suggested she was probably still alive when he started to disembowel her. <sighs> why? Why does, why? I remember reading that and I was like, oh my lord, oh my lord. Okay. Oh boy. This poor woman. I mean, girl. This poor girl. Oh my god. Well, I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't know anyone that does, but still. There was that. Afterward, after all the, 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 the stuff, the torturing, he went to the theater and said he was too distracted and just cried the whole time. Later that night, realized that Marion's father, Perry, probably wanted to see her before handing over the ransom. He realized this like after crying at the movie theater. He's like, wait a minute, for a ransom to work, they usually, they want the kid back. They want the person back, right? It's usually a two way street. Um, Again, he's not the brightest bulb. This is why she was covered in makeup, the clothes, the big snuggy looking thing, and had piano wire in her eyes. So she looked just lively. So at the trial, Hickman was one of the first defendants to use not guilty by reason of insanity in California, which was a brand new law at the time. And said, he said, a supernatural being called Providence made him do it. So even though he had already told police he needed the money to attend, get this, not just college, a Bible college in Kansas City. He wanted to go to Bible college, because get this, he wanted to be a minister. Last time I checked, um, well, that's not what ministers do. They save people, not kill them for money was also heard when he was in prison, like awaiting trial or during the trial, that he was asking a prison guard, not a prisoner, a prison guard, how to act crazy. So he could act, act crazy at his trial for his defense. Well, this is just where he gets st st stupider and stupider. And then he was also examined by a doctor and they found him sane. Like before the trial. So I don't know where they were going with this. But personally, I feel like no one's truly 100% sane if they kill someone. Like I know there's the self-defense argument, but I meant like this. Like what sane person 
just like, oh, I'm strapped for cash. You know what I'll do? Ransom. Like, that's not, I don't feel like a sane person does that. But I can see where they're coming from, like, not schizophrenia to the hundredth degree, like, doesn't know where he is, doesn't know his name kind of thing. I feel like we can all agree that he's not just the most right person. It was thought that he just wanted revenge on Perry for getting him fired from his job because he was caught forging the checks. But he also wanted fame, they predicted, because he wanted to be as famous as throwback moment as Leopold and Loeb. Yes, at this time they were in prison, both of them. But he wanted the recognition that they got for killing Frank. Bobby Frank, there we go. I did not expect to see them when I was doing research for this. So in February of 1928, he was found guilty. I mean, how could you not find him guilty? And sentenced to death. And he was hung on October 19th of 1928 at San Quentin Prison. So, justice was served. He's dead. I mean, either way, he'd be dead at this point, but... I just... What kind of person is he? Who does this? That's the story. Not a ton on Marion. Unfortunately, I tried to find more about the family and stuff, but it was just about like who had worked at the banks, who was a twin, stuff like that. But that is the unfortunate story of Marion Parker. Um, I feel like based on my last video, which I put a lot of time into it and like got personally like into it, this is kind of a not a great follow up, but. I did what I could. I didn't practice this beforehand. There is no more sunlight. This video is probably gonna look so bad. I'll try to put in a lot of photos so you don't see the light quality. And as the cases get more to modern times, there are usually more photographs and stuff. There was a lot of Leopold and Loeb though, because I mean, that was the one thing Will got right. They did get the fame, the famous from their terrible crimes. So yeah, I thought he was stupid and horrible. I can't imagine like at 19 too. It's insane. But uh, if I can find Marion's, like find a grave so you can leave some flowers or kind words only or try to learn more about her and her family, I'll link it below if I can find it. Some people when it's situations like this don't want the graves to be known so they can finally have some peace. But if you're respectful to them, I think it should be okay. So, until next time, and I've already done research for the next one, and I know I say that each time, but I got a couple pages worth. Believe it or not, the next one's even more brutal. See you. Well, see you next time, and this has been another True Crime Time.